Does the Ecclesia, the new man, as a holy nation made up of Jew and Gentile, take on the mission, the original role of the nation of Israel to the nations, not as a replacement in the sense that Israel is done away with since we see God's heart for Israel, especially reflected through Paul in Romans 11, but in faithfulness only being fulfilled through his servant, his son, and thereby through his body, the new creation? Yeah, I, I suspect that this question you know, is focused on replacement theology. I mean, he does use the word replacement. I'm not sure why ecclesia is defined as the new man. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to try not to get too distracted by the terminology. I mean, the, the church, the ecclesia, refers to the collective body of Christ, the community of believers. Uh, and he has that in his question as well. It, it's, but it's not a, a new man like an individual. Uh, again, so I, I'm not quite sure what to do with the terminology, but let's just use that to you know, what I just said is sort of as a segue to jump into the whole replacement idea. Uh, I would say that I, I didn't hear anything in the question that rules out replacement theology. Uh, so I don't know if the questioner is for it or against it. For, for listeners who don't know, replacement theology is the idea that the church, the circumcision neutral thing we call the church, has replaced Israel as the people of God. And then that has a ripple effect or ramifications uh, in the minds of many anyway, you know, as to how we should look at the nation of Israel today, political, you know, Israel, uh, whether we should sort of endorse everything they do or, you know, like, don't ever, don't ever criticize them, you know, because that's cursing them. Then God's going to curse you because this is the chosen people. And what somebody, somebody else would say, no, they're not the chosen people. The church has replaced them and all that. So I don't really hear anything in the question that rules out replacement theology in the sense of, I'm not sure where the questioner is at, but I think personally, you're asking me, so I'm going to give you my own personal take. I think replacement theology sort of overstates its case. I like to say replacement theology affirms some really obvious things, but then extrapolates them to some things that just aren't quite necessary. For example, since the Messiah, who is the king, and of course, therefore the elect son, okay, the elect son of the previous king and the elect son of God, because God calls the king my son in the Psalms, and the king is therefore the firstborn in the sense of inheritance. Uh, since the Messiah, the king and the elect son, the firstborn son, represented the nation, and since the nation is in the Old Testament also called God's son, because of this co-identification, when the Messiah, through his faithfulness, creates, you know, through his death and resurrection, the new people of God, the church, well, in, in that sense, then Israel did indeed fulfill its purpose. So when we say, you know, through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed, okay, we shouldn't be looking into the future as, as though it, Israel as a nation is somehow going to be the conduit for blessing to all the other nations. They, they, Israel has already served its purpose. It's produced the Messiah, who also is the Son. Israel is the Son of God, so is the Messiah. There's six, it's six of one and a half as another. Israel has already fulfilled its purpose. And this is exactly what Paul says in Galatians 3.16. Here, here's what he says. Paul writes, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, plural, referring to many, but referring to one, to your offspring, who is Christ. It's the end of the quote. Now Paul stresses the singularity of the language there, seed or offspring, not offsprings corporately. Uh, one of those promises was Genesis 12, 3. You know, one of the promises that, again, get sort of claimed and, and, you know, put under the person of Christ, attached to the person of Christ, one of those is Genesis 12, 3. Through you, all nations of the earth will, will be blessed. You know, th through your seed, Abraham, and not, not corporate seed, not the whole nation, but one seed, Paul says in Galatians 3, 16. That seed is Christ. So again, consequently, there's no basis to argue that corporate, national, ethnic, political Israel is still supposed to play this role. The role's already been fulfilled in Christ by virtue of Galatians 3.16 and other passages. Now, is that a basis, though, to conclude that corporate, again, national Israel has no eschatological role? Well, I personally doubt it, but it's likely the wrong question to even ask. There are, of course eschatological purposes for Israel, if we're talking about the gospel being embraced, embraced by Jews in a significant way before the Lord returns. Well, that, that's in the future yet. But the New Testament is clear that the future of national or ethnic Israel isn't the key to Gentile conversion. That was something that began at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. We spent a lot of time talking about that, that on the blog. In fact, the reverse is sort of, you know, the, the case where Paul says in Romans 9 to 11 that, that 
the Jews, you know, were set aside, blinded so that the Gentiles could be grafted in. And then after the, after the Gentiles, after the fullness of the Gentiles, and we've talked about that theme a lot in the podcast, after the Gentiles are saved, then we have the opportunity for, quote, all Israel to be saved. And I'll say something about that just in a second. Uh, what I want, I want to get back here to this, this ethnic Israel thing. Now, what I mean by national Israel or ethnic Israel or political Israel is, is that I'm referring to all the biologically ethnic Jews, okay? That's what I mean by national Israel. Uh, Jewishness is determined, you know, in that sense by biology. You're either a Jew or not. Now, in the modern state of Israel, that isn't the case. Jewishness isn't just determined by biology. I mean, you can, you know, convert, and there are different formulas for who's a Jew and who isn't. Now, I know personally of no Old Testament prophecy that was specifically behind the events of 1948. You know, the regathering, the, you know, putting... Recovering, becoming a state again. I don't really know again any any Old Testament prophecy in context that pointed to that event. And lots of people get there through like chronology and and you know jubilees and all this kind of stuff. You know, so I realize you know some are going to try to make that case, but there's nothing point blank. Now, having said that, though, I believe Israel deserved a homeland. I don't believe Israel was the villain in the way things played out in in the 1940s. I also believe that today Israel has a right to defend itself. So I'm you know I'm not denigrating the, the nation. I mean, that they, they have the right to do that. Israel today is a state that's largely apostate in a biblical theology sense. Not only are they still in the state of rejecting the Messiah, many people anyway, but a lot of them are even agnostic or atheist. Israel today is, it, it's not a mirror image of, you know, what we would think of as godly Israel in scripture. That just isn't where political Israel is at today. But again, having said that, as a state, Posing the desires of other nations to wipe them out, wipe them off the face of the earth. They certainly have a right to exist and defend themselves, even if we're talking about just humanitarian grounds. I would also say, on again, on a biblical theological level, there are not two peoples of God. There is one people of God. I don't know what the New Testament could could say different that would make that any clearer. Paul in Galatians three just goes over that again and again and again. Uh, there, there's one people of God, this thing we call the church, made up of both Jew and Gentile, both physical descendants of Abraham and spiritual descendants of Abraham. There's no biblical warrant for saying that that truth either tells us to look down on the nation of Israel. I mean, I'm I'm not a leftist, okay? <laughs> let's put it that way, but I'm also not somebody who thinks that America is a new Israel uh, or something like that. I mean, that 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 basically turns the whole question into idolatry, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, when, you know, when Israel does right, in, today we should support them. When they do wrong, you know, we should say, hey, you did wrong. Uh, that, that's not incurring a curse of Genesis 12 or any other passage on us when we point out sin. I mean, frankly, God did that in the Old Testament. I mean, God's railing against Israel all the time when they do wrong, and they do do wrong. So, again, th- this whole I- idea of you know, hands off Israel, don't ever criticize them, I think is just absurd because God does it, and he does it a lot uh, in the Bible. Now, let's go back again to Romans 9 to 11 a little bit. We, we ought to spend a little bit of time on this. This, this is an involved question. I don't want to skip anything here. Uh, in terms of biblical theology, again, all Israelites or Jews who refuse the Messiah are still left in exile. It's as though they're in exile from Yahweh. Paul tells us in Romans 9 through 11 that this blinding was partial, And it was the key to the gathering of the Gentiles and reclaiming Yahweh's family from those nations. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. This is why the prophetic timetable, now this is a key thought. This is why the prophetic timetable in the New Testament was not marked by the existence of Israel as a state. Instead, in several places, the key idea, the key event in the New Testament was the fullness of the Gentiles. Has nothing to do with Israel being a state. Paul's concern, what drove Paul, was that the reclaiming of the nations, okay, again, defined as extracting people from every nation who will embrace the Jewish Messiah and become part of the one family of God. His concern was that that activity, that program, that plan be accomplished for the sake of Israel. Here's what Paul says in Romans 11. This is verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, before we presume that all Israel means every Jew or the entire Jewish state or something like that, you need to look at Romans 9. 
Paul, again, similar phrasing there. Listen to what Paul says here about Israel's salvation. This is Romans 9, 22. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us? whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, i.e. the Gentiles, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, again, i.e. the Gentiles, I will call beloved. God can do that. Verse 26, and in the very place where it was said to them, now he, now he's alluding to the Jews. You are not my people. Remember Hosea, lo ami, you are not my people. In the very place where it was said to the, the Jews, you are not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. God will, will take them back. And this was Paul's hope. But we've had this partial hardening so that the Gentiles can be brought in. And, and we need to accomplish the fullness of the Gentiles because then, quote, all Israel will be saved. Now, here's the kicker. Romans nine twenty seven. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Now, Paul, I would suggest, does not contradict what he says in chapter 9, in verse 27, with what he says in chapter 11, when he says, in this way, all Israel will be saved. Paul knows that not every Jew is going to be saved. He knows that. Why? Because he said that, quoting Isaiah back in chapter 9. So the question becomes, Again, with respect to what we're reading here in Romans, what does all Israel mean? Does it mean all believers, whether you're Jew or Gentile? That's a possibility. Because, again, according to Galatians 3, okay, the, the Gentiles have inherited the promises given to Abraham. Galatians 6.16, Israel, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the church of God, the, the, the church is the Israel of God, all that kind of language. So that's possible. All Israel might just mean all believers, you know, all, the, all the people who God knows are destined to be saved. Does it mean all the Jews that form the remnant of Romans 9? Well, maybe. Could. Does it mean every Jew everywhere, including the entire nation? Probably not, because Paul is not going to contradict himself in Romans 11 by virtue of what he said in Romans 9. So let, let's review some of this. And again, I know this is, I'll, I'll try to recapture this a little bit here. Has the church replaced Israel? Again, that, that's what I sort of read into the question. In some sense, sure. Yeah. Again, Paul couldn't be clear in Romans and Galatians. I might as well read Galatians 3 since I keep bringing it up. Uh, Galatians 3 uh, verse 7 says, Paul writing to Gentiles, Know then that this that it is those of faith, those of faith, who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Isn't that curious? The scripture foresaw that. Okay, well, that's... Yeah, what we've been reading, Isaiah and Hosea and all that. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed, so that those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now that's Galatians 3, 7 through 9. We'll skip to verse 24. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And here's the, here's the climactic verse, verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. I don't know how Paul could have been any clearer that at least in this sense, in this whole plan of salvation, the church has replaced Israel in that sense, again, in that context. I just don't know what he could have said to make it any clearer. Now, again, that was the first question. Has the church replaced Israel? Well, yeah, in some sense, for sure. Second, does this replacement mean that God is no longer interested in Jewish salvation? Well, of course not. He absolutely is because we get the fullness of the Gentiles, and that's tied to salvation of, of Jews, at least some of them, at least a remnant. So it's not like the Jews are cast off and they're all like going to hell now or something like that. That's just, that's baloney. They shouldn't be treated as enemies is the point. Okay. Third, does this replacement mean that Israel as a nation 
has absolutely no eschatological role. In my mind, that goes too far. And I think it's fairly obvious because of things in the book of Revelation. I'll give you two examples. Okay, the 144,000. Now, hear me, hear me when I say this. The whole chapter about the 144,000 does not have to be literalized to be about Israel, to be about the tribes, national Israel. Again, you don't, you don't have to take a literal view of that to know that it's still about national Israel in some sense. But that's one case. The second case, I think, is probably a little clear. Armageddon. By the way, as people will learn if they don't already know, uh, that they'll learn in, in Unseen Realm, Armageddon is not a battle at Megiddo. It's a battle at Jerusalem for Jerusalem that involves the Antichrist. So Israel, yeah, yeah, Israel has an eschatological role because that's the territory, that's the thing, that's the prize that's being fought over, okay, right at the second coming. I would say that it's important, <laughs> okay? Uh, it, you know, but all that is just not the covenantal role. Uh, this idea that that somehow we have to look at Israel in such a way, or or, or never say anything bad about Israel in su- such a way, because somehow our our eternal destiny is based upon it, or something like that. That that just is not something that's really scripturally defensible. 